In the serene backdrop of Liberty, South Carolina, a true crime story of unimaginable tragedy unfolded, piercing the tranquility of the community and gripping the nation's attention. At the heart of this calamity was Susan Diane Hendricks, a 48-year-old local, who faced allegations of an act so heinous it seemed to defy reason. Charged with the calculated murder of four family members, Hendricks stood accused of orchestrating their deaths to claim insurance payouts, a sum total estimated at a staggering $700,000. The victims, her two sons Matthew and Marshall, her ex-husband Mark, and her stepmother Linda, were discovered on October 2011, their lives brutally cut short in what prosecutors suggested was a meticulously planned act of parricide. As investigators delved into the heart of this dark episode, they uncovered a chilling plot that seemed to be driven by greed and deception. The case drew widespread attention, not just for the shocking nature of the crime but also for the intricate web of evidence that pointed unequivocally towards Hendricks. Susan Diane Hendricks, born in 1963, was a resident of Liberty, South Carolina, whose life took a dark turn, culminating in a chilling case that would captivate the nation. Known in her community, Hendricks' past was marked by a blend of mundane normalcy and underlying turmoil, particularly highlighted by an incident in 2006 that cast a long shadow over her actions in the years to come. In April of that year, Hendricks was involved in the fatal shooting of Doyle O'Brien, 39, under circumstances she claimed were self-defense, as Teague had allegedly entered her home uninvited and posed a threat. The authorities at the time, did not press charges, accepting her explanation of the events. The 2011 victims included her two sons, Matthew and Marshall, who shared her home and life. Mark Wayne, her ex-husband, remained a significant part of her life through their children and shared history. Linda and Burns, Hendricks' stepmother, completed the list of victims, each bound to Hendricks by blood or marriage, each playing pivotal roles in the fabric of her everyday existence. This backdrop of familial connections and Hendricks' history painted a complex picture of a woman enmeshed in a web of personal relationships that would become central to the investigation and subsequent trial. The dynamics within this family, coupled with Hendricks' past and psychological state, would become focal points in unraveling the motives and actions leading to the tragic events of October 2011. In the early hours of April 13, 2006, and then again on October 14, 2011, the quiet community of Liberty was shattered by two separate but equally tragic incidents. Both crimes were linked by a common thread, Susan Hendricks and a deadly method of murder, shooting. The first incident unfolded in 2006 when Doyle O'Brien was fatally shot at the Hendricks residence. Susan Hendricks claimed that Teague had repeatedly entered her home uninvited and had threatened her prompting her to use deadly force in what was initially deemed an act of self-defense. This incident did not lead to any charges against Hendricks at the time, and the case was eventually overshadowed by the more gruesome events that would unfold five years later. On October 14, 2011, the tranquility of liberty was once again disrupted when law enforcement was called to two homes on Pinedale Drive. This time, the scale of the tragedy was far greater encompassing multiple members of Hendricks' own family. The victims included her two sons, Matthew and Marshall Hendricks, her ex-husband Mark Wayne, and her stepmother, Linda and Burns. Each had been shot, plunging the community into mourning and disbelief. The discovery of the bodies was a grim affair. Responding to a report of a possible self-inflicted death, deputies arrived at the scene to find a harrowing tableau. Matthew Hendricks was found lying on a bed with a fatal gunshot wound to the head, a gun placed ominously on the nightstand beside him. This scene was meticulously staged to suggest a self-inflicted death, a narrative that Susan Hendricks would initially propagate. In another bedroom within the same residence, Linda Burns was found with a gunshot wound to the torso, her life extinguished by the same ruthless violence. A short distance away, in a neighboring home on Pinedale Drive, the bodies of Marshall and Mark Hendricks were discovered, each bearing the fatal marks of gunshot wounds. The positioning of their bodies and the manner of their deaths further compounded the horror of the situation, suggesting a calculated execution rather than a spontaneous act of violence. The immediate reaction from law enforcement was one of shock and determination. 
The community, too, reeled from the impact, struggling to comprehend how such a tragedy could occur among them, especially at the hands of a family member. The investigation into the tragic events in Liberty was a meticulous endeavor that required the collaboration of various law enforcement agencies, including the Pickens County Sheriff's Office and the State Law Enforcement Division, SLED. The complexity of the case, coupled with the shocking nature of the crimes, necessitated a thorough and methodical approach to piecing together the evidence and uncovering the truth. One of the first and most significant leads in the investigation was the discovery of multiple life insurance policies. Susan Hendricks was found to be the beneficiary of nine policies worth an estimated $700,000, all on the lives of the victims. This financial motive became a critical piece of the puzzle, suggesting a premeditated plan to benefit from the untimely deaths of her family members. Forensic evidence played a pivotal role in unraveling the case. Gunshot residue analysis emerged as a key element, revealing a substantial amount of residue on Hendrick's clothing. This finding was in stark contrast to the initial suggestion of a self-inflicted death, particularly as tests showed that Matthew Hendricks, whom Susan had accused of killing the others before taking his own life, had no residue on him. This discrepancy raised significant doubts about the authenticity of the, the narrative Hendricks had initially presented. The investigation also scrutinized the crime scenes and the positions in which the bodies were found. The placement of the gun on the nightstand next to Matthew and the supposed self-inflicted death note with his signature were carefully examined. The inconsistencies in these staged elements, when compared to the forensic evidence, pointed towards an attempt to mislead the authorities and frame Matthew for the crimes. Hendrick's statements to law enforcement were another area of focus. Throughout the investigation, her accounts of the events fluctuated, often contradicting the physical evidence and forensic findings. These inconsistencies became a hallmark of the case, undermining her credibility and further implicating her in the murders. The collaboration between the Pickens County Sheriff's Office and SLED was instrumental in gathering and analyzing the evidence. The agencies worked tirelessly, sifting through the complex web of financial motives, forensic evidence, and inconsistent narratives to build a coherent picture of what had transpired. Key turning points in the investigation included the confirmation of the life insurance policies, the results of the gunshot residue analysis, and the breakdown of Hendrick's alibi under scrutiny. Each piece of evidence added to the growing body of proof against Hendrix, leading to her arrest and subsequent charges. The thoroughness of the investigation ensured that every lead was followed, every piece of evidence was examined, and no stone was left unturned in the pursuit of justice for the victims. The judge, convinced by the evidence presented, ruled that the case was strong enough to proceed to trial, a decision that propelled the case into the next critical phase. At the trial, the prosecution focused on painting a detailed picture of Hendrick's motive and actions. They argued that the life insurance policies were a clear indication of Hendrick's premeditated plan to eliminate her family members for financial gain. The forensic evidence particularly the gunshot residue found on Hendrick's clothing and the absence of such residue on Matthew, played a pivotal role in challenging Hendrick's version of the events. The prosecution aimed to dismantle the defense's narrative by highlighting the calculated staging of the crime scene and the manipulation of evidence to frame Matthew as the perpetrator. The defense, on the other hand, sought to shift the focus towards Hendrick's mental health issues. They portrayed her as a troubled individual struggling with mental illness, which they suggested could have clouded her judgment and actions. The defense emphasized that Hendricks had been under the care of a psychology practice and was on multiple medications for her mental health conditions. They also presented an alternative narrative, in which Hendricks, in a state of shock and confusion, had attempted to revive her son Matthew after finding him, inadvertently moving the gun to the nightstand in the process. This counter-narrative aimed to evoke sympathy for Hendrix and introduce doubt about her capacity for premeditated murder. The defense argued that her actions were not those of a cold-blooded killer, but of a distraught mother grappling with an unimaginable tragedy. The trial was a battleground of conflicting narratives, with the prosecution and defense each weaving their version of events based on the evidence and testimonies presented. The jury was tasked with navigating these complex arguments to ascertain the truth and determine Hendrick's culpability in the heinous crimes committed against her family members. 
The legal proceedings in this case were not just about the presentation of evidence and legal arguments. They delved into the deeper issues of mental health, familial bonds, and the lengths to which individuals might go for financial gain. The outcome of the trial would hinge on the jury's interpretation of these factors and their verdict on Hendricks' guilt or innocence. The trial of Susan Hendricks culminated in a decisive verdict, finding her guilty on all counts of murder. The jury, swayed by the compelling evidence presented by the prosecution, rejected the defense's portrayal of Hendricks as a victim of her mental health issues. Hendricks was subsequently sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, a verdict that underscored the gravity of her actions and brought a somber sense of closure to a case that had captivated and horrified the community of liberty. The aftermath of the trial left the community and surviving family members grappling with mixed emotions. Relief at the conclusion of the judicial process was tempered by the irrevocable loss of four lives and the unsettling knowledge that the perpetrator was one of their own. The scars left by the tragedy would take time to heal, with the community coming together to support each other and the families of the victims in their journey towards finding peace. The case of Susan Hendricks also stirred broader reflections on several critical issues. The role of mental health in the criminal justice system came under scrutiny, with debates arising over how mental health conditions are addressed in the context of criminal responsibility. Hendricks' defense had highlighted her mental health struggles, raising questions about the intersection of mental illness, criminal behavior, and the adequacy of support systems for individuals facing such challenges. We thank you for taking the time to delve into this case with us. Your engagement and reflections are invaluable as we explore these challenging narratives together. If this video has moved you or sparked thoughts you'd like to share, please do so in the comments below. Your insights contribute to a broader understanding and dialogue around such critical issues. If you haven't already, we invite you to like this video, comment with your perspectives, and subscribe to our channel for more content that seeks to illuminate inform, and inspire. Thank you for your support and participation.